I think in some ways, decoding the gurus is part of and a product of the meaning crisis without actually realizing that they are. And so in this video, I want to look at the strengths and the weaknesses of decoding the gurus. And I want to do so through a, um, a representative video. This video is by Andrea from her show, Andrea with the Bangs. And she interviews or facilitates a discussion between Paul Vanderclay and Chris Kavanagh. Decoding the Gurus, great podcast, um, is sort of like a colonial version of Bad Wizards. And it's hosted by, um, and I say colonial because it's hosted by Chris Kavanagh, who's an Irish uh, anthropologist living in Japan, and Matt Brown, who's an Australian psychologist teaching at an Australian university. And so this podcast has some strengths and weaknesses. And I want to use this video or clips from this video to illustrate it. Decoding the Gurus is a great podcast. It has a number of strengths. And I want to focus on just three. And I want to focus uh, in particular, firstly, on um, the fact that it has a healthy skepticism. Now, what do I mean by skepticism? Um, philosophically, skepticism goes back to uh, an ancient Greek school, um, and it was a reaction to Stoicism and the Epicureans. It's a sort of a it's a type of Socratic inquiry. A more modern example of skepticism is the hermeneutic of suspicion. What do I mean by that? Well, that's a phrase by the French uh, philosopher Paul Ricoeur. And I'll put a link in the show notes to this essay. So this is an essay about Paul Ricoeur and um, this phrase, the hermeneutic of suspicion. And I just want to read a couple of, read a couple of fra um, paragraphs from this um, essay. So jumping in halfway through the essay, uh, in his highly influential work, Freud and Philosophy, Ricoeur draws attention to three intellectual figures of the 20th century who, in their different ways, sought to unmask, demystify, and expose the real from the apparent. Three masters seemingly mutually exclusive dominate the school of suspicion. Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Now, very briefly, Marx's analysis of religion led him to the conclusion that while religion appeared to be concerned with lofty issues of transcendence and personal salvation, in reality its true function was to provide a flight from the reality of the inhumane working conditions and to make the misery of life more endurable. Religion in this way served as an opium of the people. Similarly, Nietzsche's understanding of the true purpose of religion as the elevation of weakness to a position of strength to make weakness respectable belied its apparent purpose, namely to, to make life um, for the slave morality, the weak, the unfit, a little more endurable by promoting virtues such as pity, industry, humility and friendliness. Thus, Nietzsche unmasks religion to reveal it as a refuge of the weak. Likewise, with Freud, the same pattern of unmasking to reveal and distinguish the real from the apparent is evident in his analysis of religion. So while religion was perceived to be a legitimate source of comfort and hope, where one is faced with the difficulties of life, in reality, religion was an illusion that merely expressed one's wished for Father God. Um, now, Ricoeur is highlighting or showing how these three uh, figures were exposing the gap between the message and the motivation. And this is the, um, the first strength of this, this sort of sceptical approach is the first strength of decoding the gurus. And you can kind of get a sense of this approach, um, this kind of skepticism, 
in how Andrea reflects on what she's learned from decoding. The- Started off like questioning things. You help me be like, don't just follow the these people blindly. They are experts in their own fields, perhaps, but not in everything. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, I am I okay. I'm like I remember saying I'm still an IDW girl. Like I remember saying that at the end of our interview. But you know, then I was like, okay. I gotta I gotta start maybe being a little more critical thinking. Blah blah blah. Taking things with a grain of salt. These are just people. And then I moved on in my journey over through to narrative and stuff. And that's how I ended up having a channel focusing mostly on stories and and film. The next strength, I think, is best described as the ability to identify techniques and um, the the way in which religious like gurus or gurus who behave, uh, secular gurus who behave in a in a, a religious way. Um, their patterns, so identifying their patterns of behavior or their particular rhetorical techniques. And that's a key feature of decoding the gurus. And you get a, a sort of a, an insight into this in um, Chris's summary. Some of the distinctions about the way we approach the content um, comes from some of that. So could you get a little bit more specific on exactly what you want to critique on your channel and why? I mean, Peterson seems to have been a fairly regular. um, There's at least as there's a lot of IDW types in your list as I just scroll through your um, your podcast topics. Yeah, that that, that's uh, that's fair to say. And I, I think it's in part because the a lot of the figures that we cover that fit the archetype would be like your your kind of Brett and Eric Weinstein's and um people more recently like Russell Brand and 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 so on so that that is the IDW kind of heterodox guru type is is very close to the archetype that we are interested in 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 part because it's I actually think it's more interesting to look at than the um, like outright polemicists or, you know, partisan uh, pundits or that kind of thing, though, in some cases, I think they might have um, veered towards that. But yeah, so we in looking at these figures and Matt and I are both academics. He's a psychologist and I'm a cognitive anthropologist. And we're fairly, I would say, just by nature, like fairly critical, slightly disagreeable (laughs) types. And, you know, maybe like all people on on YouTube, like too opinionated, um, we're not on YouTube. I think we are on YouTube, but, you know, all commentators on the internet uh, have perhaps too many opinions and we're no exception in that regard. But we we try to apply a little bit like the same critical lens that you would find in in academia um, when reviewing papers or articles or arguments to the content of the people that we look at. And we, we don't just focus on IDW people. You know, we've looked at Gwyneth Paltrow, Ibram Kendi, uh, Jonathan Haidt, so on. So we so we do try to kind of, uh, and, and Carl Sagan. And we don't argue that all of these people fit into the archetype that we've identified uh, to the same degree. We're kind of interested in the the differences. And so we do this thing after we've looked at the content that we uh, we try to score everybody on a like a little uh, scale that we've came up with with ten facets, right? Uh, in part, this was because the people that we were covering were different in lots of respects, and we wanted to acknowledge like some of the the differences there. But um, but yeah, so in in that respect, in terms of things that we're critical of, it it is stuff like uh. The pejorative word would be galaxy brainness or like a tendency to um, present expertise across a huge domain of topics and uh, like a kind of uh, not just, you know, that you're an expert in, in one thing, but rather that your expertise allows you to speak confidently about a whole host of things, including, you know, 
uh, it could be virology, politics, uh, history, it, across the wide domain of like possible ideas. And and that on itself might just be a kind of Pollyannish, you know, uh, way of thinking. But when it's coupled with things like reinforcing strong in-group, out-group boundaries, um, flattering uh, people who follow you as being the ones that are good and actively like seeking to understand the world, um, attacking institutions and and kind of alter established sources of knowledge and promoting your own uh, yourself as an alternative, a more reliable source of knowledge. So a kind of like reactive anti-establishment sentiment, self-aggrandizing um, and and grievance mongering stuff like that. The, oh, and and um, promoting conspiratorial heuristics uh and and like i mentioned uh kind of partisan um polemics of of either stripe also not particularly good so the more of those kind of things that you do the more that we would kind of flag it as a, a toxic style of of modern guru you know andrew t or something like that would be an example i think that most people would would fit into that category um but but we're not saying that that everybody that we cover is the exact same because it wouldn't make sense like we we just did christopher hitchens and eliezer yudkowski but we've also done reverend moon uh of the moonies and and uh like nasim taleb so yeah it's a it's it's we're not trying to argue that everybody that we cover is is the exact same kind of thing and that they're all like toxic and dangerous um that uh just just in case any now the third strength is a little bit harder to illustrate with a particular clip because it's a theme that kind of comes up sort of throughout chris's comments and the discussion but basically it's that it's it's the combination of combining critical thinking and uh, evaluating morality and and um it's a it's a gr it's a strength of the podcast that you can evaluate you can think critically and that helps you evaluate the morality of these gurus and, and that's a that's a combination that's a healthy combination that's a good combination and it's 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 something that the podcast encourages and and uh, Chris embodies. So if I if I can find a clip, I'll I'll uh, I'll illustrate that a little bit here as well. Broadly speaking, we'd be in the space of like academics talking about topics which are not entirely academic, and I would also put us in the space of people that are critical of the the kind of IDW. Um, position. I think in part because uh, that space feels a little bit like it's represented as the only um, responsible critique from the left of the excessivism of, you know, uh, like far left politics or, or progressive, you know, extremes. And from my perspective, it's it's kind of not necessary to be an IDW person in order to critique them. You could just be a normal center-left person. The weaknesses of decoding the gurus, and I've got three weaknesses as well. Uh, the weaknesses come from a, a couple of causes and partly the end of third wave atheism. And one of the results of the end of third wave atheism is the the unacknowledged problem of a residual morality and and this also is going to be a little bit hard to illustrate with particular clips but it'll come up several times and particularly towards the end of the discussion and quite often chris will talk in terms of making a, a moral evaluation now he'll acknowledge that of course you know everyone has biases they're academics he describes um, matt and his as politics sort of center left and 
that'll have implications on or ideological implications on on how they and the fact they're secular materialists will have implications on how they evaluate and view the world however there's right from the beginning there's an assumed um well we're 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 analyzing negative behavior we're analyzing toxic behavior we're making evaluations about what's good what what we, what content is good or what techniques should be used or what rhetorical techniques are bad and um, where the gurus are behaving by are using um, patterns of behavior or or, or or content that is morally negative and the difficulty here is that and this is how second wave atheism uh, was unable to resolve this problem and this is why um, it's the end of second wave atheism and we're into something else now is we've got this residual morality we identify things as good and bad and we make moral judgments and we're able to make moral judgments but we don't have a framework or an explanation for why and how we make moral judgments toxic is a word that has sure sure taken on resonance in the last number of years how would you if you had to use something other than toxic what what would you what would you describe yeah what 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 would you use instead of toxic uh, uh negative just like you know somebody promoting like bad heuristics and increasing the level of polarization and hyperbole in the discourse uh, encouraging like strong in group out group uh, hostility that kind of thing so like negative <laughs> uh, the negative spectrum of of uh like activities and and effects on the world so, so do you think your posit your podcast would be especially negative or especially positive i'm curious about oh, your choice of that in our case well i'd say we're like it, it depend well it would largely depend on your perspective of what we're what we're doing like from my perspective obviously what we're doing is overall positive but that's so that would be an in-group out group thing no well yeah 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 in terms of like whether people you know who agree with us would depends on who you ask. well that's the yeah, that's yeah. the in-group out group dynamic yeah yeah but so the question would be like all like any group that you belong to will have an in-group and out group dynamic right like if for a group to exist there has to be an out group the the when i talk about in group out group dynamics in a like a negative or or toxic way i'm talking about like very strongly constructing that there's uh a, a, like a kind of positive truth seeking in group that is you know that full of good people versus a a negative uh, you know uh harmful group that is seeking to destroy um and needs to be opposed out group uh so like the the kind of you know a binary black and white machiavellian view of the world uh, and i don't think in general like if you're if you're into toy trains and you join a group uh of train enthusiasts that makes an in-group of train enthusiast toy train enthusiasts versus non-toy train enthusiasts but it doesn't require that you will see all non toy train enthusiasts as like evil out group but there's an out group right so so uh, what would you describe as the in group for your podcast and so on as well like there there's a lot of people that are powerful orators and and good with self-help messages and i would i would count jordan in that and also that in a certain respect that thing that i raised at the start about the ability to to speak in a, a very fluent way across uh, bringing in lots of world history and myth and it's intoxicating for for people um for for good and for bad i i think that way of speech is a gift that that people who are good orators have so so one of my points is a potential issue that the heuristic of transformative experiences can can also be a constant with people that are uh you know fundamentally still exploiting people or, or or kind of like promoting divisive messages and and there are different like levels of that but the other 
part, and this, I think it really catalyzed for me when you were saying that is, you know, people are focusing on different things, right? Uh, when they're in discussions. And when I look at the content of um, Jordan and Jonathan and, and various other people, and much lesser extent, John Vervaki, I pick up a lot on the promotion of conspiratorial thinking, the comments about the war in Ukraine, anti-vaccine rhetoric, climate change contrarians. And if you go to, you know, Jordan Peterson's timeline, you'll see hundreds of tweets all about those topics. It's not incidental to his project. He's setting up a, a conference in, and organizations, Jonathan Pajot is part of them, which are outlining, you know, as they define it, an alternative vision. And, and people in those groups are also tend to be very relaxed about their criticism towards Hungary or or other authoritarian regimes that that couch it in in Christian or or kind of religious values. And to me, that looms large in their content, right? So that when I see people having discussions which doesn't criticize that or doesn't push them on it, or, and when I read it to people, they say, "Well, I'm not interested in their their political stuff. That's not what I'm." talking to them about, it feels to me like that's ignoring a kind of big envelope of criticism. And that I'm not saying that everyone that engages with Jordan Peterson is going to become, you know, like a supporter of Putin and a, a strong anti-vax person. But I would say that those are not minor parts of his output, including in his, his podcast. And the fact that he works for the Daily Wire, now, you know, kind of like a self-identification is that he's on the polemical side of or the partisan side, at least, of the right wing media ecosystem. And and so I I guess that I, I'm curious your thoughts on that, because it might I, I think that might be part of the reason that, you know, when you look at our content, it, you see that we are kind of focusing on the wrong thing and missing things. And I probably feel the same about when I'm looking at the content of, you know, uh, the discussions about egregores and, and, and the uh, symbolic interpretism. Now, uh, the second criticism doesn't come out as much in this particular video, but it is, there's a little clip early on, and I think it informs, it's, a, it's an underlying structural weakness, and it... Um, it means that 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 a lot of the other things that Chris will want to say and argue for are weakened by this particular weakness, and and that is um, a sort of a postmodern mindset. And there's a there's a clip where Chris has to concede. Well, yeah, different defining the in or the out group, defining what's ultimate, defining sort of ultimate moral values is really going to be dependent on your perspective. I'm just trying to get a sense of what your podcast is, what your goal is, who your audience is, what your mission is. Yeah, those are all legitimate questions. And I, I there's a couple of things that I would say. The the first in terms of like the overall mission, I I think that we view it as, you know, promoting critical thinking, a, a kind of academic approach to stuff. Matt and I are both people that are like, uh, in favor of the scientific method, and and we are both secular materialists, uh, so to speak. So I'm sure that comes across in in things that we cover. But out of those things, in terms of like what I would see as as actively promoting, would be the primarily the the kind of critical thinking and and advocating for consuming content critically, and in terms of whether that's more to preach to the choir of people that don't like that the people that we cover or to reach out to people who might follow them in ways that we would see as like non-critical. Uh, I'd say that we are like, we are giving just an opinion on the content, which is, you know, very popular. The, the, the people that we tend to cover, they've got tons of material and they're releasing podcasts. They've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans or millions of fans. So um, by engaging with the content, it's not like it's hard to find people that have, you know, other 
takes or positive views available. Um, and uh, so we're our view, my view can't speak for Matt would be that we're offering uh like a perspective on that content and that we try to be a bit fairer perhaps than is common for the people that are very critical of the figures that we cover but the third weakness of decoding the gurus is an inability to describe spirituality on its own terms so towards the end of the discussion uh Chris seems to think that, um, well, firstly, he, he reacts to Paul. Um, he thinks Paul is criticizing sort of the um, center-left politics or, or, or saying that secular people that are uh, secular materialists can't be moral. You asked, Andrea, you know, how I'm, I'm why I'm, uh, I would distinguish myself from the new atheists. And, and part is because actually study religion words lots of the new atheists don't um but the 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 other part is that i i don't think that inherent conflict has to exist like i i think tolerance and and uh like a willingness to recognize that people can draw meanings from different you know uh like secular or religious meaning structures is is beneficial and i'm that's why I'm like I'm quite reactive to things which are are, are presenting a secular world as, as fundamentally like cold and alienating and void of of meaning because I I don't think I, I think that presents that ends up in the discussion with how are atheists able to be moral uh, without you know a a religious structure to keep them on the straight and narrow and I think all of those questions have been like discussed and answered in 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 hundreds of years of debates between atheists and religious people so in in i guess in part that's a whole bunch of things but that's that's partly um my reaction to that paul is that i i think it is you're completely right that we should take seriously the the attachments and and social bonds and and you know you could frame it in other language as you suggest like the you know the experience of the numinous the the like esprit de corps or or being touched by the holy spirit or the that's your commitment to the sangha or whatever it might be but um in while acknowledging that i'm i'm not sure that i agree that my secular worldview requires like kind of uh that that's a metaphysical reality that i can't comprehend because i feel like i comprehend it okay and that i understand people that value it i don't personally believe in the metaphysical aspects of it but you know that's it, it doesn't feel that mysterious to me that that exists in human given the kind of social beings that we are and what Paul is actually criticizing, though, what Paul is actually challenging is how does secular materialism describe and explain spirituality? It can only explain spirituality on its own terms. I think Chris thinks that Paul wants a place at the table. And you get the, you get the sense that Chris thinks that, well, Paul wants to have his two cents about, and Paul probably does, and 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 everybody, uh, Chris makes this point, you know, everybody on the internet has opinions. Chris thinks that Paul wants his place at the table, uh, uh, wants to be able to say, well, and it all comes up uh, after talking about demons and then talking about the morality of Jordan Peterson. And there's a real sense that Chris doesn't understand the central purpose of Paul's project is to think about, well, why are we here? Uh, thinking about C.S. Lewis's book, The Miracles, which describes the incarnation, describes the, the arrival of Jesus uh, in, into the world as the central miracle of Christianity and all other miracles point to or flow out of that miracle. And 
And Paul talks about, you know, rereading Miracles by C.S. Lewis and trying to make sense of the secular world he inhabits and the, the claims of Christianity, including this central claim of the incarnation. So when they talk about demons, and they, they spend a lot of time talking about demons because of a discussion on Twitter between Jonathan Peugeot and Chris Kavanaugh, or maybe not a discussion, an exchange, a Twitter exchange. And so they get onto the topic of spirituality and how to describe demons. And Chris Kavanaugh's research is about sort of negative, um, negative in a sense of um, you know, difficult or arduous religious rituals, um, sort of, uh, for example, you know, fasting, where you deprive yourself of some food for a while, that, those type of rituals, those type of religious rituals, that's Chris's area of study. So Chris is viewing demons as um, data or beliefs that people may hold, and they may hold them genuinely, and they may behave in a certain way as a base on based on those beliefs, but Paul's asking, well, what it, what are those people attempting to describe when they talk about demons? Is um you know in in many ways, I mean, you have Tom Holland working on, you know, working on the question of would would the would the ancient Greeks cons- have considered themselves religious? Well, it's a really mm-hmm. tricky question because, of course, after you know, after the Enlightenment, religion sort of becomes a category. Before that, through much of world history, the ritual, the worldview, let's say, which is not a theological abstraction, but is sort of a completely embedded cosmology, is is something that, and, and ritual, again, ritual is sort of a word that's kind of an abstraction. Um, you know, someone going to a temple in the first century wouldn't say, I, I'm, you know, they might they even if they use something that we connect with ritual we mm-hmm. sort of take this concept of ritual and sort of demythologize it and and deconstruct it into into something that is in some ways analogous to let's say what a scientist or someone say working in a technology plant if they're working in a clean room or or a doctor who's going into surgery he undergoes this ritual of you know, hands, and and that's of course deeply embedded in his own worldview of you know germ theory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I guess to me that that adds two questions, which would be a part of the to me part of the difficulty of um, let's say secular materialism has always been the difficulty of understanding non secular materialist people from the inside. Because mm-hmm. all worldviews have an outside and an inside, and so the, um, you know, the the modernist path has tended to be, well, those these demons are so on and so forth, and in terms of what I see happening, you know, I'll talk about what I what I gained from Peterson because I didn't need Peterson to teach me the Bible. I already knew the Bible. Um, I didn't need Peterson to teach me the value of religion. I was already deeply com- committed in with respect to religion. Part of what people who have at least maintained um, a connection to inhabited religious roots is, in fact, the question of what do we do with sort of this worldview flipping that we tend to do in the modern West. For example, if I am if I am preaching to my church out of the Book of Genesis. On one hand, so let's say from a modernist biblical studies perspective, I can I can fairly clearly see I can sort of map out a cosmology that they might have, where the world is sort of a, a table and it sits on pillars and there's a dome on the top and there's there's God's throne in heaven. I mean, this sort of perspective that I inhabit, that I say, okay, so the the writers of the text were inhabiting that kind of worldview and they're they're writing from it. And I am preaching to a group of people that very much see ourselves as inhabiting a, a globe, which is going around the sun, which is part of a galaxy, which has all these galaxies. And and so for a preacher, you're always trying to s- sort of connect these two worlds. And, and one of the things you also very quickly learn is that, um, let's say if you, if you read much 
if you look at so so part of the Dominican Republic has or the Dominican Republic, part of the Christian Reformed Church has had you know Navajo ministry for about a hundred years, and so then you you know you gain access to let's say native populations and to the degree that they are still sort of inhabiting an embedded worldview versus those that have been impacted by this dominant Western culture that has tended to colonize them, you you very quickly have to ask questions of, okay, well, what on earth do we really mean by all of these these things? Even the word spirit is a, is a very interesting word. And Chris is unable to see this. He's unable to see that question because it's a weakness of um, his paradigm. It's a weakness of the decoding the guru's approach that because they're approaching it from this materialist angle, they're unable to explain spirituality. They have, they're, they're trying to see everything with a view from nowhere, um, to use Paul's expression. It's, it's the meaning crisis is about whose monarchical vision are we uh, are we seeing all of reality from? Uh, if you've got a comment, I'd love to um, read it in the comments.